Hello, everyone. I want to thank you so much for joining us again this week here at Kingston Christian Fellowship. Uh, we trust you're doing well through this time. Uh, we're praying for you. We're trusting that God's purposes are coming forward. Uh, look, I want to continue along the series I've been doing with the Holy Spirit. This will be part two. Uh, look back in the YouTube videos for uh, part one, and we'll continue on today in part two. Look, the book of Acts is not so much a theological book as it is a practical application book, right? It's it's not quite the book that's sitting in an armchair and debating theology, right? Acts is the book where we see uh, the practical application of everything that is in this book, everything that God intended. And uh, sometimes it's so easy for us to slip into armchair theology uh, debating uh, doctrinal and theological positions uh, from this book when the whole goal uh, of Jesus's heart, of God's heart, is that we would step into and walk into the fullness of God for us and for the earth in practical ways, that the application of his love would be applied in relationships and real life from, from day to day, that we wouldn't just read and hear that Jesus loves us but that we would experience that every single day and that we would love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so Acts is a phenomenal book uh, full of practical application and, and wonderful things and uh, incredible instruction for us uh, here today. So we're going to read a bit uh, from Acts 2. So if you have your Bible with you, your phone, uh, your iPad, anything like that, uh, turn to Acts chapter 2. Let's just read a little bit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages of the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Tell me that God isn't intentional at this specific time. He lined things up for, for this specific moment for the day of Pentecost, right? Uh, so there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Skip down to verse 11. Both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, uh, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And he goes on to uh, regurgitate what the uh, the prophet Joel had, uh, had prophesied before. So here we see this incredible expression of the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire, uh, you know, visual tongues of fire coming down and resting on people, people speaking in languages they've never spoken before. And this is where um, uh, many people get stuck. Many people have trouble is the expressions or the word manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about that today because it's really not as scary as it seems. Um, and uh, there are just a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of things we want to uh, want to discuss here. Look, these manifestations, right? God is spirit, the Bible says. And if you want to have relationship with a God who is spirit that operates in the spiritual realm, 
then some supernatural things might happen. There is a spirit realm. Now that's more difficult for us in North America uh, to, to relate to. Our culture is so materialistic uh, with things and objects. Uh, the East definitely has a better understanding and more familiarity with the spirit realm. Uh, you know, there's a few things of, of why we, we find this hard to swallow. One is a, a lack of control, right? A, a supernatural expression is always going to be beyond ourselves. Uh, and the other, again, is, is the fear of the supernatural, right? And again, it's found more in, in North America here than in, in other parts of the world. And the reality is, is again, God is spirit. Acts 2 describes what happens when spirit meets flesh <clears throat> excuse me when spirit meets flesh right that this is what happens when one world collides with another when the supernatural world meets the natural world right things happen when an all-powerful god collides with your flesh right we, we see these sorts of things and yes they are unusual but look they are from god we know by the incredible fruit that came from this one instance, you know. So I want to talk about uh, responses to the Holy Spirit very quickly. Uh, often you can tell where somebody is with the Holy Spirit, where they are in their journey or their relationship with the Holy Spirit, uh, depending on how they feel about, uh, you know, the first couple chapters of, uh, of Acts there, uh, how they respond to it. But look, this, this uh, passage that I just read you, describes three types of people and I want to show you what they are and you can find yourself in it and and where you are on your journey and so the first group we see are those that are experiencing the Holy Spirit and speaking the wonders of God in other languages right this is Peter and and whoever was in the upper room that experienced the um the uh, the violent wind and and the holy spirit being poured out right there was that group that heeded jesus's instruction right i, I heard somewhere that you know 600 started in the upper room but only 120 actually had the patience to to wait it out for for the holy spirit to come and so um you know we're talking about a group group number one a group that heeded jesus's instruction to wait they were able to be patient. They were able to understand, have self-control, you know, but be able to wait until uh, what Jesus promised had come. And so, you know, they valued God's plan and purpose uh, for his people, for, for the earth. You know, group one are the people that responded well, right? Group two are those that were amazed and perplexed, but curious and interested in pursuing its meaning right verse 12 says amazed and perplexed they asked one another what does this mean so th they didn't resist it they didn't run out the front door or the back door they were hungry to learn more you could say that this wonder of god made them wonder then you've got group three there are those who made fun of it they didn't accept it and they weren't interested in learning more. Right? Verse 13 says, some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Look, this, this third group, right? This third group that wasn't interested, that actually made fun of them. It says, you know, this part of the crowd judged the fleshly reactions instead of the spiritual fruit. That may be the most important point of what I'm going to mention today in this video that they judged the fleshly reactions instead of the spiritual fruit. Again, this is what happens. Acts 2 is what happens when spirit meets flesh. And in this event, you know, we see people being gathered, people from all nations across the world, uh, right? This, this passage said, and let me remind you in verse five and six, it says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Look, it says this, when they heard this sound, a crowd came together. A crowd came together. Look, the ministry of the Holy Spirit always brings unity, not division. Okay, let me say that again. The ministry of the Spirit 
always brings unity and not division. See, we often think that if we let the Holy Spirit into the church, it's going to divide our church. And that's simply not true. Right. Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 3. He uses this phrase, keep the unity of the spirit. See, the only reason we have any kind of unity or, or any ounce of unity is because of the spirit of God, because of the Holy Spirit. He brings unity, not division. You say, well, why do churches divide then? Well, I'll tell you why. If there is division, it only comes from the people in group three that reject the Holy Spirit in his ministry. It is not the spirit that divides. It's people that reject the spirit that divide, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, right? And so the, the spirit of God actually brings an incredible unity. And in if you let him into your church, if you let him into your life, he will bring things together like, like nothing else can. Right. And, you know, today people still judge the fleshly reactions instead of looking at the spiritual fruit. And unfortunately, they miss out on the incredible ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I want to talk very quickly about a few ways that God has prepared us to live in the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the main way uh, that uh, Luke records here in the book of Acts in this specific situation it's so incredible i want you to notice the very first thing that happens right after this this outpouring with the tongues of fire and the violent wind the very first thing that happens is peter stands up and addresses the crowd and he teaches and he preaches and he instructs everybody as to what it is that is going on look one of the main ways that god helps us receive and experience the spirit of god is through teaching, is through being informed. Look, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, uh, God prepared the community to receive it by explaining what was going on. God's response was to explain what was happening so that others could join in, join in the party, join in the celebration, join in the incredible ministry that was that was happening. Look, let's, let's go just a, a layer deeper. And uh, in fact, you know, God had spoken of this day, this day in Acts 2, this day, he had spoken of it through the prophet Joel, look, hundreds, if not thousands of years before. How is that for preparation, right? God cares so much. He doesn't just do things after the fact. He prepares you for what he's bringing into your life. And this was hundreds, if not thousands. You know, I, I haven't looked up. Uh, when the prophet Joel wrote this, but look at the preparation generations and generations before the actual event, God prepared people to be able to accept the gift and the manifestations and the expressions of the Holy Spirit. So incredible Look, God is willing to explain himself. Uh, he doesn't have to, but he is willing to explain himself because he cares that you participate in the life of the Holy Spirit. And here in, in Acts is one of the places in which he does that. And we here 2000 years later have this incredible uh, book to lead us, guide us and, and continue to minister to us so that we can receive everything that God has for our lives. All right. So Peter gets up, teaches and preaches, and he doesn't just, you know, pull out his own opinion or his own idea. Look, here's an incredibly important point. Peter uses the Bible, right? Joel would have been part of the Bible of Jesus's day, right? The Old Testament, it, it would have been part of their, uh, their scriptural canon, uh, right? So he, he went back to the Bible. A really good place to go right whenever you want instruction or teaching on anything he goes back to the Bible look and uh, and the Bible is full of God's supernatural manifestations right many people have tried to use this book to discount God's supernatural qualities and, and the Spirit's manifestations, but look, the Bible is full of them, right? The sun standing still, right? People walking on water, people being raised from the dead, people transporting, translating. How about people ascending, right? Where did Enoch go? Well, he went up in a whirlwind. 
uh, Elijah followed him, right? Where'd Elijah go? Well, he went up in a whirlwind. Can you imagine seeing that? I mean, the, the, the book is full of these supernatural happenings, healings, uh, all kinds of wonderful things, even in the gospels, the life of Jesus, the apostles, and their ministry, right? The Acts of the Apostles, the book we're looking at is full of stuff like that. And how, how about this one, right? We have uh, John, John the Revelator, right? How is God going to communicate this wild um, revelation, right, to John for to write it down, right? So right at the beginning, when God's preparing John to receive this revelation and, and write the book, what does he do? Well, he knocks John out, you know, maybe a little uh, anesthetic, you know, maybe God's thinking, let's knock him out because uh, this is going to be heavy duty, right? This is a, a deep revelation to, to grasp and hold on to. So, you know, Revelation says that John fell down as if dead. Right. And that's often where we get our term slain in the spirit. Uh, John fell down as if dead. Man, the book is full of a supernatural God interacting with uh, a natural earth. And so, look, if it's in the Bible, we've got to make our peace with it. Right. If it's in the Bible, um, you know, we may not understand it, but we can trust the God uh, who does. And so, uh, you know, if it's in the Bible, we, we've got to make a way, make our way through it and, uh, and process through it and thank God that he is so kind and loving to, to help us through. Okay, look, why did some receive what the Spirit was doing and some reject it? Because we had Peter in the 120 who accepted it, who participated in it, and thank God they did because, like I said, thousands, right, it says 3,000 were added to their number that day incredible fruit because this group said yes to the holy spirit because this group said yes we will experience god the fullness of what you have for us right so peter and the 120 they accept it here's two reasons they accept it because one they were informed we talked about that peter knew exactly what to say he recognized what was happening because he was informed all right, and the second is because they were prepared, right? That they, they were studied and they understood that this is what God had promised, but they were also prepared. It says that they were all together. They were in prayer. They were together in unity in the upper room, right? They they were practicing the waiting on the Lord uh, that, that, that Jesus had asked them to, right? They, Jesus was preparing their hearts to receive the gift. So they were able to wholeheartedly jump in because they were studied and prepared. And look, this was, at least to my knowledge, this was a brand new thing. Let me ask you, have you ever seen tongues of fire come down and rest on people? I'm not sure if it was recorded anywhere else in the Bible before this, right? This was a brand new happening. Uh, the Peter and the, and the 120, the people in the upper room, they could have said, what? You know, tongues of, I don't recognize this because they'd never seen it before, but because they were studied, because they were informed and prepared, they were able to accept the new thing that God was doing, the new thing that the Holy Spirit was doing and witness with their spirit. They were able to receive it because they were prepared, even though it was new. Think about that application for your own life today. All right. So look, Jesus told them it was coming, and even though they didn't know what it would look like, they were still able to receive. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we have been informed. We have the Bible full of supernatural goodness sitting in here, and uh, and God has been preparing our hearts uh, to, to receive the fullness of what he has given to us. So let's end with this thought. It's that God has made a way for all types of people to enjoy the life of the spirit, right? Some taste and see that he is good. Some jump in and that they sense the witness of the spirit with what is happening. But look, God doesn't ignore intellectuals. He used Peter to speak to those who desire understanding to bring explanation. God doesn't look down on intellectuals, on people that like to have an understanding of what's going on. That's okay. 
Some like it this way, some like it that way, right? But God loves everybody and the Holy Spirit is for everybody. And so, you know, we don't beat up on people that like to use their brain. But the reality is, is that you have to use both your spirit and your brain. You have to use intellect, wisdom, you know, all those things, as well as the uh, the spirit that God has given you to interact with his presence. So look, the fruit is at 3,000, right? That's uh, that's Acts 2.41, right? Um, the truth is, is that 3,000 were added to the number that day. No wonder the Holy Spirit has been under attack. No wonder his manifestations and the way he works and the way he operates. No wonder he's been under attack. No wonder the enemy is telling us lies and trying to uh, hold the Holy Spirit back from us experiencing everything that God has for us, the fullness of the Spirit. Uh, the Bible says that he gives the Spirit without measure, right? So let's address our barriers, let's address the walls, let's address the wrong mindsets we have, and let's move forward and build relationship with the Holy Spirit and live in the fullness of God for us. Look, we're, we're, uh, we're praying for you, we're believing the best for your life, uh, we're declaring good things over you and for the church. Um, in the earth right now, God is preparing the church and releasing the church into its most fruitful season. Wonderful things are happening. Jump in, dive in, enjoy the Holy Spirit and all his incredible benefits and, and the goodness of, uh, of who he is as a person. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you again.